Thank, thanks very much, uh, Marijn and Matthijs, for two beautifully complementing perspectives on the... Uh, sorry, sorry, Marijn and Sven, for two beautifully uh, complementing perspectives on Matthijs's work. Um, we're running a little bit behind on schedule, so I propose that we open the floor to questions immediately. Uh, if I'm correct, there's two microphones going around. Um, so, if you would please, if you have some questions or comments, um, please raise your hand and one of the two mics will come to you. Um, we have roughly 20 minutes, I would say, for questions, so please uh, keep it short. Um, the floor is yours. Not everyone at the same time, <laughs> but please also don't be shy. And turn on the lights there because we ju we're just looking into a black uh, like box. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot imagine that. Oh, I see one in the, all the way in the back. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question for uh, Marijn. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you can say something about, uh, so you spoke about uh, the, the um, difference between gradual transformation within the institution as an insider uh, uh, movement and uh, uh, versus utopias as an outsider movement. Can you say something about uh, really the, the the struggle on the ground, the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's exactly, uh, I mean, of course, the initially this whole dual strategy um, revolves around the discussion uh, of the revolution and, and how I think it's the third international or something should deal with, should it either work within kind of uh, pre-democratic or, or let's say, the, the beginning of democratic institutions or should it overthrow these institutions? That's what the dual strategy uh, is about, is you do both at the same time. So um, in, in that sense, uh, and I, I think that's also interesting here to mention is maybe that, that this kind of uh, rejection of the classic dichotomy of leftist politics, uh, revolution versus reformism, was kind of a, a staple of uh, the Zapatista movement that kind of rose in the in the middle of the 90s, and the Justice for Janitors movement that that came to inspire kind of the Dutch cleaners. It has a sort of link to that movement. So there's a kind of you can sort of say that there is a uh, a trajectory from kind of the Argentinian and and the Latin American movements more in general to the uh, a lot of the, the cleaners in LA were from Latin America and then kind of the, these new types of, of politics were heavily copied by, by European social movements to say like, okay, let's, let's forget, you know, because um, you would have on the one hand the, the anarchists and say like, okay, I'm, I'm completely outside of the institutions, I, I, I will build my own thing and, and you will have kind of the the revolutionary groups who, who built their party structure and in, in kind of waiting for some kind of repetition of 1917 that's never going to happen. Uh, so basically, the, 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 I think the, this dual strategy comes from a kind of a new moment in the 90s where everybody goes like, okay, that's, that's a ossified tradition, those old dichotomies we no longer need. We need, we need to combine these in, in kind of creative ways. Can you say maybe a little bit more about this Latin American inspiration for the cleaners movement as a sort of, yeah, because I think you're absolutely right that in the 90s it, it became sort of uh, a real option again to have this sort of revolutionary moments without losing uh, a pragmatic perspective in the form of what the Zapatistas were doing, what was happening uh, in, in Argentina that 
sort of caught on to what was going on in the US. You said a little bit about that, but can you say a bit more about this this Latin American context? Uh, yeah, so I was like, when I was at the end of my teens, uh, the, the, this whole Zapatista thing became very big and it was uh, gonna have a kind of huge influence on the whole anti-globalization movement that I ended up being swept up in when, when I started studying uh, political science and I studied, of course, globalization. This was the big uh, question of the time. So you had uh, this mysterious figure wearing a mask, uh, Subcomandante Marcos, uh, and smoking a pipe on a horse somewhere in the jungle in Chiapas and, and this kind of entire movement of, of indigenous people. Uh, and they had this slogan which is called Caminando Preguntamos, so we, we, we walk asking questions, so we, we don't take any of your models. And it was funny because I was walking around and in, in, in I was hanging out in Amsterdam and, and I met some really disgruntled anarchists who were working with the Zapatistas and they were like, yeah, they're not, you know, they're, they're reformists and they're, they, they were really, there were all these Europeans kind of support movements who were really a, a bit annoyed that the Zapatistas didn't fit in their models of, of politics. Uh, and uh, so f and for other people, this was kind of a, an inspiration, in, especially in Italy and Spain. There were like thousands of people going to Mexico to, to be part of these marches of the, the Zapatistas. On the one hand, they claimed some kind of autonomy for this uh, Chiapas region, so that this is a kind of the idea of, you know, you create a revolution and you have your own state. But on the other hand, they kind of, they, they made a march through to Mexico City and, and did a kind of pragmatic lobbying effort to pass an indigenous law. So they were, they completely didn't care about, you know, fitting into one or the other uh, traditional model of doing politics. And I, I think this was a very kind of uh, big inspiration uh, at the time for a lot of people. Thanks. There was an another question up there i think no can can i can i maybe also pose this question about revolution to you uh, sven because you spoke about the new institutionalism i'm wondering do you see also the possibility of a sort of micro revolution taking place within art institutions um like in relation to the kind of work that matthijs is making or the kind of efforts that, that this space is, is, is doing within this institutional sphere? Or, or would that be a, a bridge too far? Well, I think one could perhaps differentiate between different historical phases. So at least in the beginning, mm -hmm. 90s, early 2000s, I think uh, the new institutionalist model was still very much predicated on this idea of turning the art institution into a kind of um, a critical space um, that uh, could generate and maintain a kind of uh, gegenöffentlichkeit, a, a counter publicness. Um, so it was a very, it was very much focused on discursive activities, um, uh, um, lectures, and uh, also publications, and so on. I think now, in recent times, in maybe the last, I don't know, five to ten years, uh, there has been, I think, an increasing focus also on the need to uh, not just um, organize um, a certain kind of uh, publicness via debates, discussions, lectures, mm -hmm. publications, and so on. But I think there is more of an engagement now also really with uh, the, the institutional infrastructure. So mm -hmm. uh, how can you actually indeed um, turn the institution into something that, that works, that functions in a different way, and that therefore is also perhaps more um, um, uh, yeah, more adaptable and more suitable for uh, engaging with different groups, different communities, forms mm -hmm. of activism. Uh, how can you actually not just, you know, create a different kind of output, right? How can you mm -hmm. not just change the facade, if you will, but how can you actually change uh, the whole modus operandi? And I think yeah. this is something that I now see increasing. So the, this, this question of publicness is an interesting one, I think. So, so Matthijs was bringing the museum to the central station, um, but I think it's interesting to ask the the question the other way around also how can you because as you sh you showed in the image of the facebook uh, friends uh, uh, marijn it's still a little bit it looked like two separate worlds in a way so how could you bring um the cleaners or the organizers into into this into this institution 
So Matthijs brought the museum to the, he, to, the, to the public space. How can you bring the public space into the art institution? Uh, well, I, I think uh, I would say that M Matthijs is a sort of a micro institution. Um, <laughs> uh, and so it's, it's not, I think he's, he's mixing both worlds at the same time. And, and as I already said, this is not kind of a, uh, it's not as, as if you can achieve a kind of seamless merger between mm -hmm. these two worlds. I mean, well, cleaners will come here and mm -hmm. I mean, I think for them this discussion will be very abstract. Uh, sure. They don't really, will not really care about how this fit in. And it well, I don't think that most cleaners are very familiar with art theory uh, or would really be kind of yeah, but I mean, I, I don't, let's just say, I mean, I, I think you can achieve it, but it's something that you would have, y you need to have quite extensive time devoted to actually being uh, comfortable with art discourse or like to, and, and I think uh, that so merger you can never achieve, you can only achieve a kind of attention which can be productive for both sides. I think it's important, I, I agree, but I think it's important to make it clear that this is not about a kind of intellectual hierarchy, right? It's not about saying, and I'm sure that's not what you're saying, that you know, we're the academically trained people here, so we have a much higher degree of, um, you know, also of, let's say, political consciousness. If even, you know, if anything, in many cases, I think it's it's the opposite. If I look at my university, um, you know, uh, for the past couple of years, the cleaners there have, in a sense, shown that they're uh, much more advanced in their thinking in many respects than both the staff members and the students. But it's, of course, about um, um, being in certain discursive spheres. You might also, you know, you could also say being in certain discursive and theoretical bubbles. It's also a question of language, right? It's a matter of language That's, as well, sure. I know that Matthijs sure. is concerned yeah. with this, you know, the, the yeah. language we speak in different spaces and how can that become compatible with each other. So it's, sure. it's not maybe yeah. a question of intellectual no, uh, no, exactly. No, I think it's, it's important to be absolutely clear about that. Do we understand each other's language? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But I think that the aspiration to merge these worlds completely, I, I don't mm. think that's very no. realistic. No, no, I don't agree with that either. You know, uh, of course, you also need a degree of specialization in order to have any kind of focused uh, conversation at, at a certain at a certain level. But how can you have that on the one hand and make sure that? Uh, these worlds don't drift apart entirely, right? So that's the challenge, and I, I don't think anybody has the brilliant answer that will, you know, settle this question mm -hmm. once and for all. But it's something one needs to keep working yeah. uh, on and working at at a daily on a daily basis. And of course, if we are thinking of, um, you know, for instance, an institution such as Bach. I mean, I've also been at, for instance, a New World Academy mm -hmm. gatherings organized by Jonas Stahl with his organization and Bach, where, yes, the people, for instance, members of the We Are Here group exactly. were at Bach, right? Yeah. So it's not a one-way street no. necessarily. But it's caminando while asking questions, right? Walking while ex asking questions. Is there a last question yes, or so remark from the audience? Two? You I have two? Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, just back here. Hi. Um, uh, I guess this question sort of um, evolves out of confusion, um, uh, so I'll just jump into it. And it's to do with form itself and the way um, certain uh, ways of acting in art derive there and establish their own forms. So. One is, say, around ambivalence or ambiguity, where art can often tend to that kind of abstraction. Um, theory can do, I guess, the same thing. Whereas with politics, when we go down to that base level of wanting to enact change together in our sort of shared decision making, it seems certainty and a kind of um, singular velocity is what's more important um, rather than allowing for doubt and um, and even sort of problematic mimicry, you know, mimicking the world, which is something art often does, uh, to question it, to critique it, and to critique ourselves rather than just critique the power structure. 
And I often feel such a deep conflict between these two things. And at pessimistic times, the end point of the thinking is, well, you know what, art's just not, can't compete in its form with political action and the thousands of years of processes that have developed to enact change together. And I guess my question is around whether things like SI or, you know, Claire Bishop talks about um, the forms that developed out of sort of participatory art in Latin America, um, Augustus uh, Bowl, for example, Theatre of the Oppressed and so on. I, I was wondering if there were more examples like this that looked at this fundamental disjunct um, from your perspectives. Thank you. I, I, there was one more question, right? Um, yeah, so only if we have too. time. Yeah, um, just um, okay. if you keep it really short. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll try. Um, this question is for Sven. You situated the current present in a history of, um, for instance, the way art institutions relate to their surroundings. Uh, at the same time, you are invited by those same institutions to perform, participate, and also shape our artistic political present. And you also reference your activity in the New World Summit and stuff like that. I was wondering what your uh, political compromise is as an academic, and whether you ever feel tempted in updating sort of your own attitude vis-a-vis -vis these developments in society and in the art world. Thank how you. Many, how many hours do we have? <laughs> um, we have, uh, you have uh, two minutes to okay. answer this question to about, um, both of these direct question about compromiso politico. About, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, of course, um, there is a perpetual uh, process of, of negotiation, right, involved and, and of sort of looking at yourself in the mirror and uh, um, kind of deciding whether this is something one should do or could do or should absolutely not do. Um, and um, yeah, this I think you know this is also I guess part of uh, the lessons of institutional critique that I have um, uh, absorbed and and internalized. So you know there is of course an almost morbid process of constant self uh, interrogation, which I you know tend to not make public so much because I feel it might become an exercise in uh, in narcissism. Um, but um, sure, it, it applies, you know, there is this tendency indeed among academics perhaps and among critics to uh, write about institutional critique as though it's simply a kind of activity that artists do, you know, or as though it's an artistic genre. Uh, but of course, institutional critique is something that, um, if anything, is even more um, necessary, for instance, in academia uh, or also among other uh, sort of um, uh, players in the art world, not just the artists. Um, but there seem to be, and this maybe returns us also to the question of form, there seem to be perhaps, um, there's perhaps a certain um, uh, lack here of, of established um, uh, forms, right? Institution critique as an artistic practice has uh, developed certain conventions, one might say, uh, you know, and one can think of artists like from Hans Hacker to Andrea Fraser and beyond. Um, how we can sort of engage as, as non-artists uh, reflexively with, within and against the um, institutional um, parameters um, uh, in which we work um, is, is not as clear in terms of how does that actually manifest itself rather than in your subjective decision to say no to something, right? To not do something. Uh, that decision then isn't necessarily uh, public or it doesn't take this sensate aesthetic uh, form. Um, so yeah, was yeah. that two minutes? Was that probably was more. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> Marijn, do you wanna add? Maybe yeah, a well, few last words? Maybe a, a final uh, note would be that I, um, I would be a bit uncomfortable with arguing that art is necessarily always inherently ambiguous and that politics is somewhat always kind of like clear cut and, and well defined. I mean, to take one example uh, I discuss in my PhD is, is kind of the use of irony in politics. Uh, there is a kind of a very large tradition uh, on, on the right in the Netherlands and also in, in literature uh, to use irony uh, to make political points. Uh, so it's, it's exactly by the grace of a certain ambiguity that you can make, you can overstep the boundaries of, of what is kind of, what one is allowed to say in society. And 
and in this way actually pushing up kind of discourse in either in, in, in a right wing or left wing direction. So in, in the Netherlands this has been a kind of, there's been a, a tradition of, I would say, ironic racism where you, you say something and then you, it, it's highly contentious, but then you put it in a kind of semi-ambiguous, uh, ironic phrasing that allows different publics to, to take different things and, and it has a certain plausible deniability. So a lack of uh, clarity in politics can be actually extremely productive and, and can be powerful. And I think in the same way one can argue that, and then oh, I probably would leave that to, to Sven to <laughs> elaborate it, but that there's a lot of art that might be kind of contain different layers, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it, it makes a very clear point. I mean, that there's, I wouldn't say that, that any artwork can be interpreted in any direction for everyone. Okay. I, mean, I would agree with the question that there is a tension, again, as Marijn has already mm -hmm. said uh, earlier on, we shouldn't um, you know, uh, assume that indeed uh, there's this one big harmonic whole. Yes, there are tensions and we're yeah. constantly working with um, those tensions mm -hmm. and we're articulating them you know, in our various practices on a daily basis. And sometimes maybe we merely arrive at a kind of you know, symptomatic manifestations of tensions that we're almost sort of uh, we're almost collapsing under the weight, but at other times perhaps we succeed in articulating them with a certain, indeed, um, um, yeah, sovereignty or with a certain um, clarity uh, that um, that can have political as well as aesthetic or mm -hmm. artistic value. Okay, let's leave it at that and think about blurring clarity in and outside over coffee. Thanks very much, Sven. Thanks very much, Marijn. We will have a break of 20 minutes because we're a little bit behind still. So we will uh, resume the program at half past three. Um, please take a look at the exhibition, have some drinks, take up some new inspiration, and we'll see each other back here in around 20 minutes from now. Thank you.